Chimpanzees are one of humans' closest relatives in terms of evolution. How do we show this relationship and how do we know this relationship? These are questions we'll explore in our video on phylogeny, which is evolutionary history. Let's start by looking at how do we represent evolutionary relationships. Well, we do that by making a diagram called a phylogenetic tree. And to interpret a tree, there's a few key principles to keep in mind. First of all, species located at the end of the tree, at the end of the timeline, exist today. And sometimes that timeline will be shown, sometimes you have to infer the timeline. Species that are not at the end are extinct. When two species can be traced back to a common point, that is the common ancestor. So D is a common ancestor of B and A. And the more recent the common ancestor, the more closely related the species are. So B and A are more closely related than B and C, because B and A share a common ancestor that existed about halfway back on the timeline, whereas B and C share a common ancestor that existed far, far back on the timeline. Phylogenetic trees are built using evidence known as homology. Homology is simply a similarity that was inherited from a common ancestor. And the more homologies you share with another species, the more recent your common ancestor was. Homologies can be structural, developmental, molecular, or behavioral. And we'll see examples of those in a few minutes. And some homologies are known as derived traits because they have recently evolved from an ancestral trait. So oftentimes on phylogenetic trees, uh, those derived traits, those newly evolved traits, will be shown using a little hatch mark. Finally, phylogenetic trees are built using the principle of parsimony. Keep in mind that phylogenetic trees are hypotheses and they can change based on new data. Well, here are two different trees, two different hypotheses for the relationship among these organisms. In this tree, this tree relies on three different evolutionary events, three different derived traits to evolve. Scales versus no scales, tail to no tail, and five toes to four toes. This tree, however, involves four evolutionary events four derived traits to appear. And so biologists would choose this tree over this tree because it's easier to believe that three derived traits evolved than it is to believe that four derived tra traits evolved. So in essence, parsimony is about the simplest explanation being the best. And given the choice between two phylogenetic trees, you want to choose the one that shows the fewest number of changes. A final note about phylogenetic trees. Anytime you see a group of organisms that includes all the descendants along with its ancestor, this is known as a monophyletic taxon. A taxon is simply a group. So a monophyletic taxon includes all the descendants and their ancestors. So now let's take a look at the evidence that is used to build these phylogenetic trees. First type of evidence is fossils. And there are many types of fossils. Dinosaur tracks, an actual fossilized human preserved in ice. Replicas that are not the actual organism, but prints left of them. Or another way of preserving uh, some organisms can happen in amber. So fossils are great because you can date them. One way to date them is through relative dating. And this uh, involves the principle uh, involved with sedimentary rock. When rock layers deposit, the youngest layer is going to be on top and the oldest layer is gonna be on the bottom. These layers are also known as strata. And so we can infer that fossils located in deeper strata are older than fossils located in more recent and more shallow strata. Fossils can also be absolute dated. And in absolute dating, we put a number on the age of the fossils. 
So this is used, uh, this involves the use of radioactive isotopes. Radioactive isotopes are basically chemicals that decay at a regular rate over time. And so by measuring how much of that chemical is left in the organism, we can determine just how old it is. And depending on how old the fossil is, different isotopes will be used. Fossil evidence has strengths and weaknesses. A key strength is that it shows us species that are no longer present today. And we can put life forms in a sequence based on either relative or absolute dating. However, the fossil record is very incomplete. Not all species become fossils, so that's a problem. Plus, if you're relative dating a fossil, it, you have to make sure that the strata is undisturbed. Otherwise, your sequence is not valid. Also, fossils may not show how related groups are. It might just show how old they are. So this is where another type of evidence, morphology, becomes very critical. Morphology is just the comparison of body structures. And we briefly talked about homologous structures. These are structures that are similar because they are inherited from a common ancestor. So the limbs of these four species are homologous and show evidence of divergent evolution, meaning they diverged from one ancestor. Vestigial structures are a specific type of homologous structure. These are homologous structures that are reduced in size and function. For example, if you were to look inside a snake, you would see tiny little leg bones. Those are vestigial homologous structures that show they have a common ancestor with a lizard. Similarly, in humans, there is a tail bone, which shows a common ancestry with species that have a tail. And even whales have little tiny hip bones, which again shows common ancestry with species that have hips. Embryology is a particular type of morphology, and this looks at the development of organisms early on in life. And this can be helpful because sometimes adult organisms don't show homologous structures, but you can see homologies in their developmental form. For example, you can see the post-anal tail present in a human embryo, but that disappears once it's in the adult form. And we can use that to show evidence of common ancestry with chickens and other organisms that do keep their tails. There is one warning to keep in mind in terms of morphology. Structures may look similar, but they may not be homologous. And here's an example. The wing of a bird and the wing of an insect. They're both used to fly, but their underlying structure is not similar. These were not inherited from a recent common ancestor. So these would be an example of analogous structures, structures that have the same function in different groups because those species evolved in similar environments, not because they evolved from a recent common ancestor. And analogous structures show evidence of convergent evolution, evolution in similar environments, as opposed to divergent evolution from a common ancestor. So to sum up strengths and weaknesses of morphological evidence, they can show divergence, but you have to be careful not to confuse them with analogous structures. Behavior can also provide evidence for evolution because some behaviors are genetically determined. For example, this fossilized dinosaur nest shows that dinosaurs might have reared their young in the same way that birds do today, which provides evidence of common ancestry. Another example is the mating calls of frogs. Mating calls of frogs are genetically determined, and so this can be used to show common ancestry between different frog species. So while behavioral evidence can show divergent evolution, you also have to be careful that the behaviors you're looking at are genetically determined. Learned behaviors, acquired behaviors, are not used as evidence for phylogeny. All right, finally, perhaps our most powerful evidence for evolution is molecular biology. By comparing the amino acid sequences in protein or the nucleotide sequences in DNA, this is a powerful type of homology. And the more similar the sequence, 
the more closely related the organisms. And again, this will show evidence of common ancestry from via divergent evolution. It's also more precise and more accurate than just looking at body structures. Another great thing is that we can use it to show relationships between distantly related organisms. However, you have to have the evidence in the first place in order to analyze it. And that concludes our exploration of phylogeny.